Black Lives Matter. Say her name. Sandra Bland. Brianna Taylor. Shantae Davis. Fannie Lou Hamer. Say his name. Amadou Diallo. Trayvon Martin. Tamir Rice. Ahmaud Arbery. George Floyd. Emmett Till. Say their names, say their names, say their names. Black lives always matter. Why is it such an unreasonable expectation for black people to live their lives in the pursuit of happiness without fear of being assaulted for being who we are? For being. For living. I quote from James Baldwin. Rage can't be hidden. It can only be dissembled. This dissembling deludes the thoughtless and strengthens rage and adds to rage contempt. That statement is one of the testaments as to why we protest in anger at the atrocities of what happens to us under this system that we were brought into this country and how we were treated for 400 years of slavery. And from that time, we organize our movements out of rage and contempt. We riot and rebel out of rage and contempt. The white capitalist system in which the country was founded on has perpetually accelerated the underlying problem of their own denial of the very constitution that the slave master founded. created under the guise of liberty and justice for all. At the time they were creating the document, the very slaves they owned were not being considered. Black people were not being considered. Therefore, their feelings were not considered. So begins rage and contempt for black people in America. The white people wanted us to be segregated, to live with ourselves, to educate ourselves, to be amongst ourselves. And yet, when that was done, and it was proven that we could possibly sustain ourselves, they realized that they couldn't live without black people. So began the process of rage to contempt. We want to live. We want our own lives. Just like white people do. Which brings me to another quote 
from the eloquently brilliant literary artist James Baldwin. If you're treated a certain way, you become a certain kind of person. If certain things are described to you as being real, they're real for you, whether they're real or not. So when black people become outraged and protest and take down fake heroes of your history, it's a result of our story of being here in these disunited states. Black lives have always mattered. You said that you were different. Said you were gonna be my knight in shining armor. You came up in here chest puffed up like I did something to you. <laughs> oh, I did. Cut that phone off. When you cheat, phone privileges are taken away. Thought you knew that. I was fine at home, taking care of my two kids, minding my business. Never have I relied on a man, and I sure ain't finna start today. I work five days a week. I put in over 45 hours a week, risking me and my kids' lives down in Jamaica Medical. And you think I'm supposed to come home and deal with a cheater? My mama told me it's better to have a piece of a man than no man at all. Forget that. I want to have peace of mind and no man. That's your problem. Do you think I need you? Hey, hey, shut up. I don't need to hear another word from you. I don't need you, this little piece of ring, or that hellion son of yours that runs around and tears up all my furniture. The only reason I dealt with the baby mama drama was because I thought you were going to be my husband. William, you had me fooled for one second, just for one second. I thought maybe there was hope for us that my king would come in and sweep me off my feet. I let you into my heart, my home, my family, my bed, my mind, and you desecrated that and all. I bet you didn't know I saw those Facebook messages on your phone. I, I didn't say nothing, I just let it go. You know, I fooled myself into believing that was just in your nature. You know, I, I know how men are, especially when they're trying to make sure their player's card is still intact. I should have said something right then. I should have nipped it in the bud right then. What kind of example am I for my daughter? Showing her that it's okay for a man to cheat on you just because it's in his nature? What kind of excuse is that? I stood over you while you were asleep, thinking of the many ways I could kill your sorry self. But then I thought about what would happen to my babies. I should have known from the conversation you had with your mama you are a no good Negro. How you treat your mama is how you treat your wife. A man like you is real dangerous. You don't respect me, my children, and definitely not my house. Here, tell her she didn't have to leave her panties. Side piece rule number one. That's the oldest trick in the book. I don't want no parts of nothing that don't belong to me in the first place. Calling me your queen? <laughs> You ain't nothing but a pauper on borrowed time. We got an international pandemic and you go do something like this? Not only STDs, but there's Corona! Look, William, I want you to get out of my house right now. Get out! Look, I don't care about no pandemic and that you ain't got nowhere else to go. Why don't you try going over to your mama's house? 
Oh yeah, that's right. She don't want nothing to do with your sorry, disrespectful ass either. Life is all about choices, William, and we have to live with the consequences of those choices. Everything is boxed up and on the curb. You got five more minutes to get all your shit and get out of my house. I want you gone. Oh, I know you're not trying to hit me. I got something much worse for you than Corona. Oh, if you take one more step, I'm gonna gut you like a fish. You feeling froggy? Chomp. Girl, I gotta talk to you. 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 Something crazy happened to me last night. Not crazy. I hate that word. But anyway. My heart. My eyes have been as heavy as my heart. Today was the first day that I haven't cried or moaned or sighed. I, I met, I met a dead person last night. Please, please don't look at me like I'm, I'm not joking. I'm dead serious. I cried. I read some James Baldwin. Cried again. Eight. Cried again. Read some more James Baldwin. Cried again and fell asleep. And just like in Angels in America, my my ceiling collapsed. The glass broke. I was I was sure I had died. I felt this warm glow over me and again I was super sure I had died and then this woman appears her, her a woman whose skin is glowing she smelled like orchids she was nude she had this smile this genuine smile It was Josephine Baker, girl. Josephine Baker, okay? <laughs> oh my God, I, I saw myself in everything she was. She held me against her naked bosom. And she said, Kathleen, you gotta take care of you. In order to fight the fight, you need to be centered, whole, and grounded. You gotta do what you gotta do to take care of you. That's a revolution too. And she just floated off. <laughs> you girl are you taking care of you please
Lisa, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, Jeremiah, put that box in the kitchen. All right. Be careful because it um has the the, the good china. In it. <laughs> yeah, girl. We just getting settled into our new place. Yeah, I am so excited to finally be here. All of that virtual uh, searching and, and inspecting. Yeah, we we came to see it before finalizing everything, but I had only been here once. Yeah, Jeremiah did all the necessary visits for us. Yeah, I wanted to be sure before I made that big move. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, we've been visified these past few months mm, with the virtual wedding and it. I know. I'm glad you guys didn't have to pay for a dress either. We saved a lot of money on that um, wedding. Yeah. Better than an in-person wedding. Even though they said that the virus was was gone by then, we know it wasn't gone. Just down to a few contained cases <laughs> that they're monitoring. <laughs> right? Oh, the packer part was easy. You know me. I, I've always been about getting rid of stuff. Hey, what was my name when we used to live together? The Replacer. <laughs> yeah, if I found something that was similar to what I already had, I got rid of it. I played myself that one time though. Bought that bet bought that skirt from Macy's and gave the shirt away that went with it. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah, on the other hand, he keeps everything. Yeah, I got to practice my patience with that man. Uh, hold on, girl. The pancake syrup is on the box. Well, in front of the box on the stove in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, girl, I'm gonna have to go soon. I gotta help him find everything. It, you would think I didn't label the boxes. <laughs> it, sometimes he's worse than the sun. Yeah, looking for something. One thing I'm glad about with the move is being able to be closer to Spirit House. I've always wanted my boy to see there. Yeah, to take him there. So, so you can see the place that I always talk about and that I work with all the time. I mean, he sees it on the website. Yeah, but... Yeah! J just go to spirithouse-nc.org Yeah. <laughs> he knows about... He knows about all the work we do. To fight racism and uh, yeah, and the so and the other things that plague our communities, mm. and the work we've been doing since the protests. Yep, since the protests began in May. Yeah, that place means a lot to me. I I'm glad to do my part with them, in addition to signing petitions and all. Girl, I saw you protesting. The way you was posting on Facebook, I thought you and David were out there every day. <laughs> yeah. But it's like I always say, know your role. Search your soul. Mm -hmm. You do what you feel led to do. Yeah. Walk in your calling. And if it's not for you, stay in your lane. Yeah, girl. It's like these companies making all these changes all of a sudden. Mm -hmm, getting rid of things and all. Yeah, if they searched their souls a long time ago, they would already be walking in it. In the, in the right direction. Girl, don't get me to preaching. <laughs> I'll be talking forever. Oh, all right. Well, it was nice catching up with you. S stay blessed, queen. Love you. Later.
Uh-huh, here we go again. 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 Come on. Here we go again. Uh-huh, here we go again. Uh-huh, here we go again. Uh-huh, here we go again. It was good, son. Where you at? All right, cool. I'm getting ready. I will be by the time you slide through. Yo, little Jay with you? Tripping for what? Yo, to hell with the popo. Tell youngin to stop tripping. They're going to all be down to City Hall anyway. Yeah, she is. In the kitchen. She ain't going nowhere, though, so we can't come back here after. It's Thursday. She's going to be in there until like 2 a.m. Acting like she cooking up the Last Supper and whatnot. Yo, hold on. Yeah, yeah, auntie. I know. I heard you the first time. Yo. Nothing, man. Yo, she just rambling. Watching too much news. Mimicking fools don't really know what's going on in these streets. That's what it is. Yeah, I got it. It's clean. I wiped it down. I wrapped it up in a t-shirt and everything. Yeah, the t-shirt's clean, Tom. Come on, man. Anyway, you got eyes on that black fool? How long is he going to be there? Yo, he ain't with his lady and kids, is he? Don't matter. What do you mean, don't matter? <laughs> nah, I ain't tripping. Yo, I got to go. Call me when you got the ride. Remember. I'm coming through the back alleys to park on Burke Street unless that crazy German shepherd is barking and growling and whatnot. He brings too much attention. If he's out there, park on Pine. All right, Joe. Later. Don't matter. Come on, man. Here we go again. Uh-huh. Here we go again. Uh-huh. Here we go again. Uh-huh. Here we go again. Come on. Here we go again. Uh-huh. <sighs> no, I'm not sitting for dinner, auntie. Because I'm going out. With Tom. Yeah, he's out. He got out a year ago. His father is good. He's living. Going blind from sugar, he says, but he's living. I know his diabetes, but he calls it sugar. We just riding. Damn, what's with the third degree? Yo, what I look like going to a rally with all them lames and fools and whatnot? I look dressed for protests. I look dressed for protests. Auntie got bars. She funny, yo. Yeah, I know what I'm going to be missing. My mouth is watering, smelling it. You can't save me a plate or two? You ain't got to give it all to the church, do you? A deal. If it's got to do with me going back to church, that ain't going to happen. I'll tell you that right now. A plate? Nah. Two plates, nothing less. All right, cool. So what's the deal, auntie? Black Lives Matter. Yo, you done said that 40 times already. Sound like a parrot. I know Black Lives Matter. Ain't you said enough for the both of us? So that's your deal. For two of your banging plates, all I got to do is be a parrot for you? Shh, done. Black Lives Matter. 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 Mm 
All right, what's up? Okay, Bree, all right, everybody's signing on here. Hey, Fred, what's up? All right, I see you, Tristan. All right, so while people are signing on, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So this is Joan. Hi. And of course, I um, welcome you guys to Joan Speaks. And um, let me just start off by saying, I want you guys to really bear with me tonight, okay? Because I may be getting emotional. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it's not easy, but I have something I have to say. And I will be honest, it is probably not going to be a very popular topic. It probably will make some people uncomfortable and frankly upset. And, you know, I, I don't care. I, I really don't care because I'm going to use my platform to talk about what needs to be talked about, period. So with that being said, um, I'd like to start by stating that I am totally with and for Black Lives Matter, the movement I am. Um, however, I really feel like not all Black lives are being included in this conversation. And it makes me angry, it, you know, and I don't understand why we are not all angry. I, I just don't. And first of all, okay, don't get it twisted. I am not that angry Black woman, you know, so you, you know, I'm not up here for your consumption. What I am is an angry mother. See, I am the mother of a gorgeous, talented, resilient daughter. And she just happens to be trans. And her life matters black cis man. Her dreams matter, black cis woman. Yes, your life matters, you matter, but so does she and so many others who are like her. And I, when I see the violence being committed against the trans men and trans women in in our community and it's overlooked, I feel sick. I am sickened by the violence. I am sickened by the ignorance. You know, I, I was once ignorant, okay? Um, I was once ignorant and I made horrible choices in my life. And I was a horrible, horrible, um, horrible mother. And I had the nerve to call myself a Christian. The way I used to treat my daughter was aberrant. I was emotionally abusive to her. I was disgusting. And I was ill-informed. A lot of you would be shocked to hear the things that I would say. My baby. Oh, child. I, the then I spewed her. And I cried about it every single day. My daughter had a difficult childhood because of me and her father. 
he's gone, of course, he's out of the picture, not coming back, baby. So I'm asking you guys, just, just do better, please. It's not that hard. All right, um, I said what I, I had to say and um, did say I'd be brief. So, um, guys, take care of yourself and please take care of each other. The virus is still out there. Peace. My family and I are taking the day off. It's like calling out of work or school sick, but we're calling out black. Yeah. We all feel we've gotten too heavy. Not our blackness, that never gets heavy. That's always light and gorgeous, grand. <laughs> but the burdens that have been placed upon our skin has become too much and we need to take a break. All week, I had to listen to my non-black coworkers complain about first world problems, like missing out on a trip to the Maldives or how their weekend was spent strolling through the park. And when asked how my weekend was, I say, well, another black man was found hanging from a tree and I had to explain to my children why this world isn't safe for them. They all mutter something that eventually leads to, uh, I need a good coffee from the break room. Wow, we are in the break room. It's like they're floating through life while we are sinking like the relatives of our ancestors who were thrown off the ships to collect insurance. You know, while their children have to worry about simple things, my children have to worry about survival. It's like we're on the same sidewalk, but we're in two different worlds. And even though we see the same things, we see and experience them differently. Last week, my family and I went to a protest and the week prior I had asked my son, how does he want to be a part of the movement? And he said he wanted to lend his voice. He's a spoken word artist and a singer. So God connected with one of the organizers and at one of the stops on the roots, my son gets on this makeshift stage and <laughs> he does his thing. <sighs> His words were so powerful, beautiful, and just filled with rhythm and blues of somebody three times his age, and he's 15. He ended with a verse from the Black National Anthem. And afterwards, these three white girls from his school approach him squealing, oh my God, Trey, you did so good. And I was surprised and proud of his response. <laughs> I don't do it for the applause, he said. I do it for my people. And I really hope you listen to the words. Our lives are on the line. And then he began chanting, and my twins joined in, Black Lives Matter. And got the whole crowd going again. <laughs> you see, we are on the front line for our lives. And as empowering as it is, it wears on you. So, if you need me and my family today, we're unavailable. We will be soaking up the sun, getting blacker and more beautiful. <laughs> and for a little while, feeling free.
I wake up daily hoping that life's dream will soon go away. I keep to myself because I have a secret. One that could care less about your melanin and your gender. Days on end, I stand at this opening, wishing and praying to the most high above for strength. And courage needed to take just one step into the unknown. It's an audious task to lift this mask. Perchance today might be the day that I can control the inward and outward release of this gaseous substance needed to sustain life. Maybe the sensation of straitjackets around my heart squeezing together and tighter with every beat will subside. These two massive hands grasp my throat and suffocate the desire to not want to do anything. Yet, I am afraid. This secret has caused people to leave without pause. I end up pushing them away before they can truly know my issue. No hiding behind the excuse of quarantine. My inner demons are seen. A cure was not rented for this disease. I got this thing that reminds me daily that he is in control. And all I can do is sit and breathe. Something that is the greatest pleasure in life has become a struggle to contain and control. To breathe, perchance to dream. Sounds easy, right? Not for me. The pursuit of happiness and normalcy seems to be an unfathomable cause. I am wounded, marked and damaged goods that even the hood would laugh upon. A black man in America with this deficiency is nothing. Overlooked, a misforgotten anomaly. Yet the door calls for my attention. Could today be a breaking point? The beat within my chest accelerates. The drum is not regulated with a metronome more so unknown. A rhythmic structure off pace and confused, still amused that I cannot move my appendages. I'm a prisoner to my own body, paralyzed by the venom of this cobra. That is agoraphobia. Oh, oh boy. Hmm. My shift at Amazon starts at 6 o'clock a.m. The supervisor tells us we have to be clocked in at 6.05 a.m. or else we get docked an hour. We all packing here like cattle or slaves on the plantation because before this pandemic, there were no jobs for any of us. There were no jobs for none of us. So now, everybody's locked in. They locked down. And they online ordering all kinds of stuff that they don't need and didn't need before. But you know what? It is what it is. I can't even trip over that. Because I need this $17.85 an hour. 10 hours a day, 4 days a week. Shoot, it's the most money that I've ever made in my whole life. And this is the hardest job ever. I am so tired. I am so tired. I ain't even 30 years old yet. But... I have to clothe and feed my kids. I'm a good mother. And I take care of them the best I can. They 12, 9, and 6. They all in school. They always growing and always hungry. They trying, but they just can't seem to get their schoolwork done. Because the free Wi-Fi sucks. It sucks really bad. And in the end of the day, by the time I come home, I'm too tired to work with them after working 10 hours a day, four days a week. I just, they give them these little, these little Chromebook, these little Chromebook computer they're supposed to get their schoolwork done on. But my thing is, how are they supposed to get their schoolwork done when they didn't even have computers in the classroom before this whole thing started? They didn't even have them in the classroom to begin with. And every time I check up on my daughter, my oldest, she's 12 and always on Facebook, so you know that got to be monitored. And uh, I had to bring my mama over to be with them while I was at work so I wouldn't have to worry about them while I work these 10-hour day, four days a week shifts. And my mama, 
She the only one that got the patience to deal with the nine-year-old. She the only one that got the patience to deal. And it's crazy. Because when he's in school, the teacher really tries to say that he has special needs. Special needs. Like, what is that? No, no, that's just the way for teachers to try to put little black boys down. And I'm over it. Because when he sits down with mama to do the schoolwork, he does just fine. The problem is, is they always set unrealistic expectations on him when in actuality, he just needs to be taught a little bit different. He just needs to be taught in a different way because he's very intelligent. He's very intelligent. I And the youngest one, well, she's my baby girl. She is. She's my baby girl and the only one that mama let get her hair done. Mama, the only one she let tackle her hair. You see, mama used that, um, what is it? That old school blue magic hair grease. Be having my baby's hair all right and tight and nice and everything. <sighs> all I know is, right now I'm slaving away. I'm packing masks. I'm packing Apple computers that my kid could be using. <sighs> To get their work done and whatever else they need me to do efficiently as possible so that I don't get fired. Amazon claimed that we essential workers, but yet they still give us half the mass that we need to do the work for 10 hours a day, four days a week for $17.85 an hour. Ain't I essential to my kids though? Ain't I essential to my kids? I'm just here trying to get ahead like everybody else. And I, please, that, that old stimulus check that came and went, all I was able to do with that was stimulate my back rent. Ow. Stimulate my back rent with the $1,200 plus the $1,500, which was $500 for each child, for the three of them, which was just what I needed to get the top rent. So that my landlord could stay off my back and away from my door. Now I got to I got to get on this 4:45 a.m. Bus and sit in the back with my head down out the window and pray. Just pray that nobody, nobody, nobody coughs all that mess and all over the place. Because I can't afford to be on any sick leave at Amazon because you know Amazon don't give you no kind of work. They don't give you any kind of, you know, paid time off for your work that you do. COVID 19 or whatever it is. I don't know. I want to make sure that I'm on time and I don't get docked any hours because if you clock in after 6.05 a.m. you will get docked an hour so you got to hurry up you got to move your behind so that you can get ahead of all the other slave workers We're all rushing in for work for 10 hours a day four days a week to get the Good evening. My name is Jamila Botman, the grieving 
an emboldened wife of Darius Botman, who was murdered Friday evening by pitiful, hateful, ugly white men at the intersection of West 52nd Street and Arlington, an intersection we used to cross every day as kids on our way to school. Sometimes he'd carry me on his back. He was strong like that, even then. Darius was tenacious. He was kind. He was more than kind. He was I refuse to cry before the world. I reserve my tears for the few people who know and love me because I no longer trust the world. If you are black, you know how sacred and endless are our tears. Let us reserve them for sacred spaces. There is enough spectacle being made of murder and grief. Too many people performing hate. Too many of us left behind making a public showing of our grief. How many weeping black wives and mothers and daughters will it take? This has never been a holy ritual, yet it has gone on religiously for too many centuries and far too many days in America. This is not a performance. I will not perform for you today. No. I will not tell you stories that paint endearing pictures of Darius. It's none of the world's damn business whether or not he was a good, murdered black man. Do I have to prove his goodness to prove his right to be alive today? Ask yourselves if you are good today. If you were good yesterday or last year. And ask yourselves if whether you are good or not, should you be suffocated in a street by white and blue men? It hurt Darius to his soul that some people hated so corruptly that they could even imagine violating another human being, let alone deny them a breath. I will say, though, Darius hated. He hated hate. There's a difference. I know. I hate hate. And if true justice was offered me in the law of this land, I would execute the men who killed my Darius. I would hang be head, shoot them in the head with bullets made of the blood, bone, and beauty of Darius and take their breath away forever. Then I would go home and eat for my baby and feed her and dance and sing for her. Believing when she is born, she will be born beautiful. I doubt that the men who killed Darius ever fathered a beautiful baby. This morning and I realized that there is only one blue I see. It's not sky or sea or navy blue. It's policeman blue. Like deathly blue. Too many wear that blue with a perverted sense of pride. Don't they know how unfashionable it's become? I 
I woke up this morning without Darius for only the sixth time since I was 24. I woke up without hope. But when I felt our baby kick and nudge my belly, I found just enough hope to get out of bed. I checked my phone and saw there were several messages about a note. A note left at Darius's memorial. Someone left a note. A friend sent it to me, a picture of it. It says, I'm sorry. I should have done more. I should have stopped them. I'm sorry. Yes, you should have done more. You should have stopped them. I'm sorry that you didn't. And you, you have failed humanity. Whoever you are, you gave me a little more hope today. I couldn't stop thinking about your notes, trying to imagine who you are and how you came to be where you are on the inside of hate, struggling to breathe. Maybe it was in that moment when you heard Darius gasping and pleading, I can't breathe, that you realized his struggle is the same struggle you've been facing all your life, suffocating under the weight of hatred, racism, and bigotry. I imagine you squirming and flailing. Of course, his death came in minutes, and your death is so slow and in stages that you almost forgot you are dying. But you are. Was it your innocence that hatred killed first? Your ability to be moved with wonder? Was it your voice that faded and died next? And then your beauty because of your complicity? What you had allowed to happen to you? Who who can feel truly beautiful burdened by such shame? Were you born on the inside and grew to believe it is safer there? Or did you marry into it? And now, you're the good wife. One of many wives suffocating in a community corrupted with hate. I never suffocated in the presence of Darius. He would never have done anything that I would be so sorry not to have stopped. Or maybe you're a son who doesn't have the courage to face your father who is destroying you. Whoever you are, I know where you are, squirming festering, suffocating on the inside of where you are. I'm glad at least that our baby will not see the inside of hate. Even though it doesn't seem so. I believe it's safer on the outside than where you are. And there's room if you ever find your way out. Hello, my name is Rhea Alexander and I have a little secret. Come here. Black voices matter.
We are innovative. We are creative. We are more than resourceful and some of the biggest trendsetters. This goes for every other area, including theater. And that's why black voices in theater are so very, very important. We need to be able to have more voices in theater to express ourselves, to have our stories be heard and be told. We are a force to be reckoned with. And the ones who try to dim our lights know that. That's why they try to silence us. Black voices matter and will continue to matter. Black voices matter. Perspective. I think that one of our biggest hurdles as human beings is our lack of perspective and our willingness to take that in because it might not affect me immediately. I think that many of us are taught at a very young age that everyone is equal, but that can't possibly be true if the opportunities for rich and poor, young and old, healthy and sick vary so greatly. Not when black voices across the nation teach their children at a very young age that they have to work twice as hard to be half as good because of the color of their skin. I think there's a need for black voices, a space for black voices, because it gives us the opportunity to highlight struggles and successes and even strategies to help other people and communities out where historically and even currently our words fall on deaf ears and blind eyes when in reality our words can encourage and help empower people to be so much more. Hi, my name is Lori Sinclair Minor and I'm a playwright, actress, singer, artist. And Black voices, Black stories matter. It matters not just that we are the actors on stage and screen, but that we are also playwrights and screenwriters, directors, scenic, lighting designers, costume, hair and makeup. It matters that we are represented in all aspects of our storytelling. It is not enough for just anyone to write a character and slap blackness on it as an afterthought. We must have a hand in telling our stories. We must have our voices heard so that our stories can be told with love, truth, and authenticity that can come from only us. Our black voices, black stories, black artists matter. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Simone Brown. I'm an actor, playwright, director, and most importantly, a black woman. I am here now, I am here forever. I will speak, I will use every breath in my body until there is nothing left. Respect me, respect us. Black voices matter. In the words of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, we wear the mask that grin and lie. It covers our cheeks and shades our eyes. See, when you're behind a mask, you can't fully be seen. You can't freely speak, hard to breathe. That's why Black voices matter, because they can speak our truth. They can share our stories. They can write the narrative and reveal to the world who we really are. So that when they see us, they see us. Hi, my name is Valerie Brookshire, and when I think of honoring Black voices, Nina Simone comes to mind. There's a famous quote from Nina Simone where she says, an artist's duty, as far as she was concerned, is to reflect the time. It's a choice, but she always chose to reflect the times especially in all situations that she found herself in, like where we are today. She felt like that was her duty. So like her, being an artist, 
me with acting and writing, I feel that it's my duty to reflect the times. And what better way than on stage? My name is Rain Raphael and I'm an actress. I believe that every voice should be represented in art. And the fact that ours isn't is an issue. When it comes to theater, our voices matter. And while I don't always call ourselves black because I understand that black is a color, black is also the thing that we identify in unity with. It's something that brings us together. So in that case, black voices matter because we have them. Because they're earned. And for all of the things that exist, like our voices, they deserve respect for their growth and what it takes to actually use them. And if not for any other thing, our voices matter because empathy doesn't equal testimony. No one can tell our stories but us. And no matter what anyone tries to do, Art itself, if it's going to imitate life, is terribly incomplete without our contribution. So our voices matter a lot. And if you want your voice to matter more, then consider our voices and hear them. My name is Terrence Riggins, and I am an actor and a playwright because black voices matter. Hi, my name is Isaiah Reeves. I am a playwright and black voices, black stories, black everything and everyone matters. Black voices in theater need to be heard. Black voices need to be elevated. For years, our voices have been muzzled. Our stories have been told by those who do not look like me by those who have never experienced what it's like to walk in the shoes of someone who looks like me. You have told the world how you think I would act. You've told the world how you think I think. You've told the world how you think I would react. And yet that is not the true essence of me. So let me tell you about me. Elevate this black voice. Now. Hi, my name is Jason Phoenix Hall and I'm an actor. And I believe that black voices matter so the truth can be exposed. It's important for black actors, playwrights, poets, rappers, any type of artist to expose the truth and tell things from your point of view. You know, a lot of people from the outside looking in don't understand what it's like to be a black man in America or a black woman in America. They don't know what we go through. You know, in high school, I learned about slavery. But in college, the thing that really, really like blew my mind was reading Frederick Douglass's biography, how he had all these little intricate details, these gritty details of what really happened and, you know, how it was to be a slave. You know, I was just shocked of how bad things really were. So with that being said, as a black artist, it is our duty to expose the truth, to, to show everyone else and shed a light on all of the crazy stuff that we go through living in America, to raise awareness, to help break down this big system of oppression. I'm gonna end it on a quote. One of my favorite singers, Nina Simone said, how can I be an artist and not speak about the times? So to all the black artists out there, keep on exposing that truth. Peace, y'all. Black voices are rich. Black voices are the truth. Black voices are strong. For so many years, our voices have been silenced, but you know what, not anymore. Black voices are proud, and most importantly, black voices ain't going nowhere.
Hi, my name is Sharice M. Salim, and I'm the founder of Ventured Soul Productions and of the Quick Quarantine Play Festival. Theater, we need to do better. Simply saying Black Lives Matter, Black Voices Matter is not enough. It's an action. This statement is an action. This means that we need to be elevating voices, local voices of black people so that they can share the experiences of black lives. So please, when you are thinking about putting your seasons together, when you're thinking about programming, if you're truly trying to serve your community and you're trying to honor what you have put in your grant applications, consider elevating local black voices. Thank you. Black voices matter because for hundreds of years, we have been told that our opinions and our voices did not count at all. And so it's important for us to speak out and speak up to let the world know how significant and influential our voices truly are. Black voices are important in theater because theater is supposed to be a reflection of society. So how can you have a true society if you are not being inclusive of all the voices that make up that society? So let us continue to amplify our strong and powerful Black voices.